Chapter 57 Tremors in Africa The year was 1951. Pulling off his safari hat, Sidney Jackson wiped his brow. Today felt warmer than yesterday. It was September 1951, the beginning of summer in South Africa, and Jackson was repairing irrigation lines in his citrus grove. Leaving his shovel standing in the dirt, Jackson sat down with his back against a tree. From here on the hillside, he could look out across the high felt, that thinly wooded grassland that stretched west into Botswana and north into Rhodesia. To the east of him, between his farm and the Indian Ocean, ran the Transvaal Drakensberg, South Africa's largest mountain range. Although Sidney Jackson had lived in this country all his life, he never tired of its wild, arid beauty. Idly he caressed his leopard-skin hatband, remembering the safari when he had shot this particular cat. That enterprise had been larger than most of his safaris. Since he had been after the king of the beasts, he had employed a whole village of natives to beat the bush and flush lions out of hiding in the tall grass. His thoughts turned naturally to the black-skinned natives, many of whom were his friends. For years he had traveled the Transvaal region during part-time missionary work. Now he spoke several native dialects in addition to English, Dutch, and Afrikaans. He loved the bush country and had developed a deep respect for the African natives who lived in it. Sidney Jackson closed his eyes to pray about his own missionary work among the natives. Soon his prayers branched out to include all missionaries working in South Africa. As he forged deeper into the spirit of the Lord, he abruptly heard himself say, William Marion Branham. That surprised him. Although he had read about William Branham, the American evangelist had not been on his mind. And who was Marion Branham? He wondered if Marion was William Branham's wife. If so, what did William and Marion Branham have to do with missionaries in South Africa? Jackson knew God was trying to tell him something, but at the moment he didn't know what it was. That night he dreamed he saw William Branham sitting in a stadium seat smoking a cigarette. That troubled Jackson. William Branham had a worldwide reputation as a man of God. Why had he dreamed that such a godly man was doing something as unhealthy and unholy as smoking? What was God trying to tell him? A few weeks after this dream, Sidney Jackson was startled to read in the newspaper that William Branham would be visiting South Africa in October. The National Committee, composed of church leaders from South Africa's three largest Christian denominations, the Dutch Reformed Church, the English Church, and the Apostolic Faith Mission, was sponsoring a two-month tour that would shuttle William Branham around 11 African cities. The tour would begin in Johannesburg on October 3, 1951. Sidney Jackson didn't know what God was trying to tell him, but he knew he had to be in Johannesburg when the famous American evangelist arrived. Trouble began for William Branham even before he left New York. When he got to the international airport, he learned that he and Billy Paul could not board their scheduled flight because their visas were incomplete. They both lacked the required yellow fever shots. So the rest of their party, his two managers, Ern Baxter and Fred Bosworth, and Julius Stotzklev, a retired army chaplain, boarded the plane and flew to South Africa ahead of them. Bill and his son got their shots at a clinic near the airport, but they had to wait three more days in New York before they could follow. It was a stormy, turbulent, restless flight across the North Atlantic. Bill's plane began circling Johannesburg at 6.30 in the evening, October 6, 1951, but dense fog and malfunctioning instruments kept it from landing until 9 o'clock. Ern Baxter was waiting for Bill at the arrival gate. Next to Baxter stood Reverend A.J. Schumann, head of the National Committee that had approved Bill's trip to South Africa. By prior arrangement with the government, Bill was rushed to the head of the customs line. Unfortunately, his visa was still not valid because his yellow fever vaccination required a 12-day incubation period before he could enter the country. Reverend Schumann pleaded with the authorities to make an exception explaining that thousands of people were right now waiting to hear this man speak. Finally, the South African Medical Association agreed to let Bill into the city, but they refused to let him travel anywhere else in South Africa for another ten days. As soon as they left the airport, Ern Baxter told Bill what had been happening in the past three days. 
When Baxter landed in South Africa, he found hundreds of people waiting at the airport to meet Bill. Of course, they were disappointed when they learned Bill had been delayed in New York. There was nothing else to do except go on without him. So Baxter and Bosworth held a meeting in one of the largest church buildings in the city. It could only fit a fraction of the people who came, so the next day they moved the campaign to Maranatha Park Tabernacle, about 20 miles outside the city limits. Ern Baxter said, The crowds have been averaging over 10,000 a night. Brother Bosworth and I have been taking turns preaching, laying a foundation of faith in the promises of God to heal. The people are very receptive. I think their faith is ripe. We'll get there tonight when the meeting is about over, but at least you can greet the people and say a few words to get them ready for tomorrow. That sounds fine, said Bill wearily. He was studying the buildings and the well-lighted streets. I didn't realize Durban was such a modern city. I thought it would be more primitive. Oh, Brother Branham, you're mistaken, said Reverend Schumann. This isn't Durban. This is Johannesburg. Isn't this southern Rhodesia, asked Bill. No, this is South Africa, Mr. Schumann replied. Well, what part of South Africa is southern Rhodesia in? Brother Branham, there is no southern Rhodesia in South Africa. I'm confused. I told my wife to write me in Durban, southern Rhodesia, South Africa. Reverend Schumann chuckled. Brother Branham, that would be like writing a letter to New York City, Canada. There is no New York City in Canada. Rhodesia is a different nation from South Africa. Then where is Durban? It's over on the eastern coast, about 450 kilometers southeast of here. How many miles is that? About 300 miles. Well, Durban is the place the Lord wants me to go. When will we be going there? Skuman looked uncomfortable. Oh, we'll get you there, he said evasively. Don't worry about that. Then he changed the subject. Maranatha Park Tabernacle was not really an auditorium. Actually, it was an enormous open-sided steel structure with a galvanized roof that had once been Johannesburg's railway station. The Apostolic Faith Mission, which is the largest Pentecostal denomination in South Africa, had purchased this park for a conference grounds. Now the tabernacle covered part of a crowd numbering around 15,000 people. The nationality of this crowd puzzled Bill because they all looked European. Are all these Africans, he asked? I thought Africans were black. Yes, these are Africans, Skuman explained, just like I'm an African. The Dutch, the French, and the English colonized South Africa. Altogether, South Africa has about 3 million people of European descent and another 10 million non-Europeans, not just natives, but also a large population of immigrants from India. In our country, we have segregation, so in most of your meetings, the two groups won't mix. But we have scheduled some of your meetings with the natives, so you will get to preach to them too. The people stirred excitedly when they learned that the American evangelist had arrived. Bill mounted the platform and looked out at the huge throng. Good evening, friends, he said into the microphone. Reverend Skuman translated each sentence into Afrikaans, the official language of the Republic of South Africa. Bill had been speaking only five minutes when he saw a blue bus roll out of the shadows and lumber through the air above the audience. The bus drove by the platform close enough for him to see the name Durban in the destination slot above its front windshield. Then it passed from his line of sight. He kept speaking, telling the audience about his trip. You see, friends, I'm really tired tonight, worn out from the flight. A few minutes later, he saw that blue bus again driving through the air, coming from the back of the building. When it reached the middle of the auditorium, it stopped. A teenage boy on crutches boarded the bus. Bill could see that one of the boy's legs was at least six inches shorter than the other. The bus continued its journey, its wheels turning just a few feet above the crowd. It stopped again near the platform where Bill was speaking. The door opened and that same teenager stepped out, this time without crutches. He walked above the people until he was halfway to the back of the tabernacle. Then he vanished in a flash of light. Directly under that light sat the same boy in reality. Pointing at the young man, Bill said, You back there, the boy with the white shirt and black suspenders, don't you come from Durban? 
Bill was not sure whether the boy would understand English, but he did because he shouted back, "Yes, I do come from Durban. You're crippled, aren't you? One of your legs is shorter than the other, and you have to walk on crutches." That's it exactly," the boy shouted. "It isn't any more," Bill said. "You're healed. Jesus Christ has healed you." A stir of amazement rustled through the audience, but nothing happened right away. The boy was pinned in so tightly that he could not test his legs. Several men picked him up, carried him through the crowd to the front, and left him standing on the elevated platform where everyone could see him. When the men let go, the boy broke out into a cold sweat. Cautiously, he took one step, testing himself on his shriveled limb. It held. His next step was more reckless, and soon he was prancing about the stage without even a hint of a limp. While the audience praised the Lord, Julia Stadskleff got the boy's story. His name was Ernest Blom, the youngest of ten children. He had been born crippled and had been under the care of a specialist since he was four years old. For two years, he wore an iron leg brace without any noticeable improvement. Later, the specialist suggested an operation, but since there could be no guarantee of success, the family had declined. When Ernst heard that William Branham would be in South Africa, he couldn't wait for the evangelist to get to Durban. He convinced his family to take him to Johannesburg. Ernst said that when William Branham spoke to him, he experienced a weird sensation, just like cold water was running through his body. He knew that he was healed. Meanwhile, Bill was challenging the audience to believe. Do you see what faith in Jesus Christ can do? Now I'm not against doctors. I'm for doctors. God bless them. Doctors are there to help you, but doctors don't claim to heal. They only claim to assist nature. God is the healer. If you broke your arm, a doctor can set it. But who is the one who makes the bones grow back together? If you cut your hand, a doctor can sew it up. But only God can make the skin grow back together. And when a doctor has done all he can for you. It's time to look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. As he spoke, he saw a green car speeding in the air above the heads of the people. Going too fast into a turn, the car lost control, spinning around and slamming into a tree backwards. An ambulance drove up, and a rescue team removed a blonde teenage girl from the wreckage. Bill heard one of the rescuers say that the girl's back was broken in several places. When the vision ended, he studied the crowd looking for this girl, but he couldn't find her. Then the pillar of fire flashed in front of him and hovered just a few feet away. Bill walked to the edge of the platform and looked down. There she lay on her back, her cot so close to the stage that he would not have seen her if he hadn't stepped forward. She looked like she was about 14 years old. Bill pointed at her and said, "Young lady, didn't you have an accident recently?" Yes, she gasped, excitement flushing her cheeks. You were in a green car that spun around and hit a tree backwards, and you broke your back in three places. Then Bill saw her by vision walking above the audience with her hands up, jumping and praising God. Without a grain of doubt, he said, "In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up, for thus saith the Lord: You are healed." The girl's mother, sitting beside her daughter, jumped up and objected. No, she can't. She hasn't moved since the accident. If she moves, the doctor said it would kill her. But even while the mother was protesting, her daughter had already risen from her cot and had stepped to the floor, where she let out a squeal of joy. That turned her mother's head. When she saw her daughter standing beside her, the mother fainted, collapsing onto the same cot that her daughter had just vacated. Spontaneously, the audience burst into praise to God. Sensing it was time to close the service with a general prayer for the sick, Bill asked everyone to lay their hands on one another and pray for those around them. While the audience was praying with fervent emotion, Bill saw a vision of a woman being healed of arthritis. When the vision passed, he saw her in the crowd and pointed her out. She waved that it was true. Feeling lightheaded, Bill almost collapsed from the strain. Vaguely, he was aware of strong arms supporting him, helping him out of Maranatha Park Tabernacle and into a car. After the meeting, Reverend Skumon took Ern Baxter and Bill home for a good night's sleep. 
On the way, Skuman talked about how wonderful it was to see these miracles and how excited he was about the meetings. Bill was not deceived. He could see the man's skepticism as clearly as he could spot an elephant trail through the grassy savanna. That skepticism did not surprise or discourage him. He had often run into the same attitude among educated Christians who wondered if his discernment might be some kind of elaborate trick, perhaps mental telepathy or else mass psychology, like using the power of suggestion to manipulate audiences. Usually he didn't concern himself with skeptics, but this man chaired the committee in charge of all Bill's meetings in South Africa. If Reverend Schumann remained skeptical, that might create problems. Although four Pentecostal denominations were the main sponsors of William Branham's African campaigns, the Apostolic Faith Mission, the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostal Holiness, and the Full Gospel Church of God, many other denominations were cooperating in various degrees. One exception was the Dutch Reformed Church, which didn't believe in divine healing. An elder in the Dutch Reformed Church braved the criticism of his peers and sat in the audience that first night in Johannesburg where he studied the American evangelist with a critical eye. When he saw the discernment reveal the problems of total strangers, he was convinced that this was a move of God. On his way home, he stopped to share his excitement with a friend who was a Dutch Reformed Church minister. The minister scolded him for being so naive, saying Branham is inspired by the devil. He's nothing more than a polished-up soothsayer. Stay away from him. The elder left his friend's house in distress. Not far from the minister's door, he knelt under a peach tree and prayed, God, I believe what I saw tonight is real, and I believe that Brother Branham is telling the truth, because nobody except you could do such miracles. I believe it, but my friend doesn't. How important is it that he sees this too? Unexpectedly, he felt a hand grab the back of his shoulder with a grip that burned like a hot iron. Jumping to his feet, he turned to see who had touched him. No one was there, at least no one like he expected to see. In the air hung a vertical strip of light about a foot long. As he watched, the light expanded, then split in two, and out from between these two halves stepped a large white-robed man with dark shoulder-length hair. The elder held his breath until the man spoke. Go, said the man in white. Tell your friend he must not condemn that man, for this is the hour of visitation. Then the robed figure vanished. Running back to his friend's house, the elder burst through the door shouting, I just saw an angel. He met me outside and told me to tell you that this is the hour of our visitation. He put his hand on my back and it burned me. Of course, the minister was skeptical, but when he looked on his friend's back, he was shocked to see the imprint of a man's hand scorched into the white fabric. That convinced him. The next morning, the three Americans met their host in his dining room. Good morning, Brother Schumann, Bill said cheerfully as he sat down at the breakfast table. Mr. Schumann was a tall, thin man with a bald forehead, a gray mustache, and thick plastic rims on his glasses. He adjusted his napkin in his lap and said, Yes, it's fine weather. Remember, this is the beginning of our summer. Our seasons are just the opposite of yours. Sensing the doubt that still troubled Skuman's thoughts, Bill silently prayed, Lord, if you'll just help me shake him up a little and convince him, that will help, because he's the chairman of the committee that's sponsoring me here. They continued with breakfast and small talk until presently Bill felt the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Soon a vision appeared. Like watching a miniature play, he saw Mr. Schumann and a little girl sitting in a doctor's office, listening to the doctor talk. On the wall behind them hung a calendar dated April 1951. Brother Schumann, your little girl is named Andrea, isn't she? Mr. Schumann dropped his fork in surprise. It clattered off his plate and fell to the floor. Yes, Brother Branham, how did you know? About six months ago, you almost lost her, didn't you? Something was wrong in her throat. They operated on her and took out her tonsils, but it wasn't very successful. She's had a hard time swallowing since then, hasn't she? Brother Branham, that's exactly right. 
Has the Lord showed you anything about her future? Yes, don't worry about her. She's going to be all right. Schumann's chair scraped against the floor as he reached under the table to get his fork. Then he said, Brother Branham, I have a confession to make. Up until right now, I was just a little bit skeptical of you, but now I know it's true what I've heard. When the morning paper arrived, Schumann was surprised to read the story about the elder in the Dutch Reformed Church who claimed an angel had touched his back last night. The newspaper even printed a picture of the white shirt with a scorched imprint of a man's hand on the back shoulder. Brother Branham, have you read this? I already know about it, Brother Schumann. The Lord showed me a vision of the whole thing. If you'll bring that shirt here, you'll see that my left hand will fit that scorched imprint perfectly. Reverend Schumann contacted the newspaper and soon a reporter brought the shirt to his house. The burned outline of a hand was clearly visible on the back of the shirt. Bill laid his own left hand over the imprint, adjusting his fingers to match the outline. Just as he claimed it would, his hand matched the imprint exactly.